Lord, we thank you for your word to us. We pray, Jesus, that you'll come by your Holy Spirit afresh and just illuminate the truth of your word to us. Lord, as we go through this talk, I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to us by your Holy Spirit into our heart about the different issues that come up. But Lord, we don't just want to know about things. We want the truth of your word to become part of the way we understand reality, the way we live our life. We want your word to be in us in such a way that it affects the way we make decisions, the way we interact with people, what we say, what we do, how we live. Most of all, we wanted to hone our life so that we become a more useful vessel for you, a greater tool in your hands to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. So we're looking at um, 1 Corinthians. I'm just going to summarise a few of the things in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, we're going to today try and get through 1 Corinthians chapter Two. So if you'd like to turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm just going to go over a couple of the verses to set our mind on some of the things that we've already looked at as we move into chapter 2, remembering that chapter 1, 2, 3, they're all on the same context of schisms within the church, division within the church. So you keep that in the background today. When, when I'm going through chapter 2, it can seem like disconnected from that issue, but Paul would obviously be saying this to that issue, so it's connected. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. I just want you to notice the word sanctification in this context, because you'll hear me say positional sanctification and progressive sanctification. Now, in this context, to those who are sanctified, that means those who are sanctified. So which one's this? This is we are sanctified. This is our positional sanctification. Sanctification, remember, is you are set apart to a holy purpose or a holy use. So therefore, you are, by virtue of being saved, set apart to that holy use. Progressive sanctification is then the progression of your capacity to lay down yourself, to give up your self-life, your personal ambitions and dreams and whatever else you may have in the natural to fulfill that sanctified purpose. This is, this is the set apart to a holy use. This is, my life is now set apart as a Christian, as a Christian to a holy use. That's I'm positionally sanctified. Now, the progression of that is now I step into that and I live that and I've got to give certain things up to enter into that. Note also the term used called to be saints. Now, all I want to do is for you to note this because I know that in other situations, defining what a saint is is going to be critical to some other doctrines down the track. So just try and remember this, that it actually, this 1 Corinthians 1-2, it tells us, so this is, if you want to know, this is how I put it together. I remember things and I go, when I'm looking at saints somewhere else, I go, now, hold on, what's a saint? Oh, that's right, 1 Corinthians talks about this. So you just sort of lock in 1 Corinthians, called to be saints. Yeah. So those who are Christ's, who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, who put their faith into Christ Jesus and are sanctified in Christ, are saints with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord. So saints are Christians who have called on the name of the Lord. Just from, try and remember that. Verse 7, so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. So that, that, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the reason I've gone here is because I've said nothing about this verse, really. And yet this is the verse that most will draw attention to when they exposit 1 Corinthians because 1 Corinthians is often seen as the book to teach about the gifts of the Spirit. And so what better place to go for the justification of that in the verse 7, it says, you come short in no gift. So therefore the Corinthian church was exercising the gifts of the Spirit and they had come short in no gift, which means we're going to find out as we go through this book, the gifts of the Spirit and what Paul might have to say about them at Corinth. Verse 8, who will also confirm you to the end, that's the Lord Jesus, who will confirm you to the end that you may be blameless 
in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a, what a great hope. Just have a look at it if you've got it in front of you because it's good to read it and see it and just resolve this. Jesus Christ will confirm us to the end. So if we truly believe we're coming into the end, we're going to face some difficult times that I do talk about it. But it says in that difficult time, he's going to confirm us. Now, confirm us means establish us and everything like that, that we'll be kept by him, kept for him, established in him. That doesn't mean we won't suffer in the natural. We might suffer in the natural, but we're kept in Christ. That we'll be blameless before him in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the day of our Lord Jesus Christ is the day of his return when everything changes. I also wanted to draw your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29, which I didn't finish off well last week, in that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification and redemption. We covered that last week, but it's verse 31, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. With humility with understanding that there is no good thing dwells in the flesh or the mortal body. So therefore, you can't bring anything of anything of any worth. Therefore, all glory, all honour, all praise will be unto the Lord Jesus Christ and no one else, not even yourself. So when you're feeling very chuffed about yourself, just remember there will be no glory given to you for whatever you think you've just achieved. All right? It's our honour to serve. And when the Lord does, we see great things. Like I've seen miracles happen through prayer and stuff. You look at it and go, that, what an honour that the Lord has worked and he's included me in what he's doing here. That's a blessing to us. We have our blessing because the Lord has used us. The Lord has honoured us with being a vessel for him, a tool in his hand, an ambassador for Christ. I'm going to be working my way through 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So we'll, it's only a short chapter, 16 verses. So we'll read the 16 verses and then we'll go back through it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's 2 Thessalonians. That's not going to be much good. Chapter 2, 16 verses, yep. And I, brethren, when I come to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Spirit, and I'm dropping holy for a reason if you've got a new King James, but which the Spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, the conclusion gives away what this is about. We have the mind of Christ. Now, what, a, what an amazing statement when you think about it. We have the mind of Christ. Just, you could just sort of go away and just sit down and we have the mind of Christ. What? So, so the mind of our God, we have his mind. We have the mind of Christ. 
So that's what he's um, talking about here. We're going to work our way through it. So let's go back and we'll work our way through it. Picking it back up in 1 Corinthians 2.1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come to you with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring you to you the testimony of God. And we dealt with it, that a bit last week. Did not come with the wisdom of words, the wisdom of human philosophy. He came in the simplicity of the power of the gospel. Verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. So it's important for us to pick up... Don't, Never get beyond this statement, Jesus Christ and him crucified. If you're starting to feel like you're getting off into too much into like end time prophecy or too much into figuring out this Greek word or, you know, you, you sort of get too far, you've got to come back and go, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Dead, buried, rose again. But verse 3, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. Now, remember, this, in, this is a literal statement. Remember, this is the Corinthian church. So we go back to Acts chapter 18, verse 8 to 10. Remember what happened to him in dealing with the Corinthian church. I'll just read it for you, Acts 18, 8. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and it's most likely Paul who converted him. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So Paul was causing trouble for the synagogue, for the Jews, for the people there who were trying to follow the old ways. He, he had converted their priest. He had converted many amongst them. Uh, verse 9, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. So God knew that Paul was afraid. This is, this is a rough town. We're about to find out. And he knew that. So the Lord came and gave him encouragement. Don't be afraid, Paul. Don't keep silent out of fear. Speak. Now, that's, that's why it's okay for him to do this. It's not okay for us to assume that we should do the same thing. When we know that there's a crowd against the Lord and a mob, don't just stand up and preach to the mob thinking that you can claim the same promise as Paul in this chapter. No, the Lord came to him and gave him specific instructions. You keep speaking. There may be times where we go, that's foolish. Keep quiet. Unless the Lord says, speak. Verse 10, so Acts 18, 10, for I am with you and no one will attack you or hurt you. So therefore he knew that there was a danger of him being attacked. For I have many people in this city. That's Acts 18, 10. I have many people in this city. In other words, you're not on your own. And I've highlighted that in my notes because that's an encouragement to us going into the end. There might be times that you feel like you're alone. But remember, God has many people and he'll have many people in the city and the town and he can cause his people to meet when they need encouragement. But verse 17, then all the Greeks took Sathenus, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. All right, And, and the judge took no notice of him. So his, Paul's fear of being beaten was real because they beat up their high priest because the high priest couldn't deal with Paul. All right, So it was a genuine fear, a real thing. And so when he says in 1 Corinthians 2, 1, I was with you. This is what he's talking about. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling right? because he knew the mob could bash him at any time. This is a real statement. This is not metaphorical. He is actually reminding them of his time with them. Continuing in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Now, I sometimes wonder whether he's saying this to compare between how he preached and what they heard in the synagogue from the priests that they use and, and you see this a lot when you listen to professors of philosophy and that they use these convoluted sort of arguments and talks this high speech unless you've sort of listened to some of those guys from university but I think that's what he's talking about those priests were speaking in such a way as to confound the simplicity of the people and they go well he must know what he's talking about listen to that complex convoluted they wouldn't even use the word convoluted argument but he but paul said my speech and my preaching were not with those persuasive words of human wisdom but in the demonstration of the spirit and power i want to clear up this a little bit because coming from a pentecostal background this is the picture that paul is saying i didn't come to you preaching doctrine i actually just came to you and performed a miracle and because of the miracle, you put your faith in Christ. I do not think that's what he's saying here. 
Because if you look closely to the language, he says, my speech and my preaching. To then turn around and say that the demonstration of spirit and power was a miracle is to take it completely out of its context and give it a different meaning. So what he's really saying is my speech and my preaching were in demonstration of spirit and power. Not a miracle, not a miracle of healing or deliverance or anything like that. My speech was in miraculous power. In context, that's what it's actually saying. So, so what is this demonstration of the spirit and power? We see that in his speech, it's connected with his preaching. It'll become clear as we go on because I think that's what he's going to unpack. That's the spirit and the power in the preaching of the gospel and a particular part of the gospel. Continuing in 1 Corinthians 2, 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, see, this adds further weight to it because we don't have faith in the power of God to perform a miracle. That's not what this is saying. It's talking about saving faith in God and then for, therefore the power of God in salvation. It's not talking about a miracle. So if Paul is talking about faith, which he is, that your faith should be in, our faith being in something, and that faith should not be put in the wisdom of man, then the faith of the believers should be placed in the power of God. Now, that sounds like the sort of language and thinking of salvation and the gospel, that our faith should be in the power of God, not the wisdom of men. So this is not talking about performing miracles or miraculous working power. Now, I'm sure Paul did that, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here. This power here is the power to save and raise one from the dead, not the power to perform a miracle. Because Corinthian churches often uses the book for spiritual gifts, people assume here that Paul is talking about the power gifts, which would then be you use the power gifts. Remember, you come short in no gifts. So therefore, you're putting your faith in the power of God. He would have no need to say what he's saying. If it is, if it is true that Paul is talking about miracle working power, then he has no need to say anything because he's just said they come short in no gift, which means they have the gift of miracles. They have the gift of healing. They have the gift of discerning of spirits and all that sort of stuff happening. So therefore, he could say, you have the demonstration of the spirit and power. I don't need to say anything. But if he's come to them and says, don't put your faith in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, he's not talking about that power. They had that power. He's talking about you've missed it with, in regard to you're believing the philosophy of people. You're believing the words of people. So hence your you're saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Caiaphas, I'm of Christ. You're getting caught up in the words that people use. Like Paul may have been a better preacher than Peter. And Apollos may have been better than Christ. You know, like, like, like in terms of the philosophy of men and the word, convoluted sort of words. So they're getting caught up in something else. He says, no, stop. Let your faith be in the power that's in the words that Paul used. And he's saying, I came to you without those philosophical words and with power. Now, I believe this is often mistaken for Paul saying that people come to faith in Christ because Paul performed a miracle. And I don't think that's what Paul is saying. I'm sure that that happened. And we know that that happened. It says that in scripture, that Paul performed many unusual miracles, unusual miracles that are assigned to apostles, the sort of miracles that you and I are not likely to perform. And if they do happen by our hand, it'll be by the grace of God in a, in a moment, like a gift, It'll be done in a situation because God is manifesting something. These guys moved in miraculous power because they were apostles. Very different. Healing here, healing there, praying. Like they had, I think, within themselves the capacity to perform miracles as these apostles to confirm the message that was about to go out. Very different than anything you see today. So I'm sure that that happened for him, but I don't believe that that is what he's talking about here. The clear focus in this section is right back at the start where he said, Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that's what he's drawing their attention back. So where does he think the spirit and the power are? Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that's what he's talking about, the power of the cross, the power of the gospel, the power of salvation. This means that we can come to people with the same demonstration of power. This is why I'm bringing it up. Because in Pentecostal circles, when you get the feeling that you need to perform a miracle 
in order to bring somebody to Christ, then you start to put yourself under pressure to pray for people to see a miracle. That's not what he's talking about here. You have the same access to the same demonstration of the spirit and power because it's the same cross, the same Christ, the same gospel and the same salvation. So therefore you can come to people in the demonstration of this spirit and power. It's not unique to Paul. That's why Paul is saying, I count all things rubbish. He's bringing himself down to say, don't have faith in all these men and all these philosophies. Just, just rely upon the spirit and the power of the cross of Christ. I preach him and him crucified. This means that we can come to people with the same demonstration of power because the demonstration of power is Jesus Christ's power over death by his resurrection from the dead. Now, we receive this promise. You might want to turn to this. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. Romans 6, 1 to 7. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now, it's going to be important because this is the context of this section. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That's why Christians who are caught up in sin, now sure, there's a member, progressive sanctification. There is, a, there's a, there is a coming out of sin and into righteousness, into sanctification, because remember, you're positionally sanctified, you're now saved, you're set apart, you're sanctified to a holy purpose. But now that progression is coming out of sin and being a set apart to that purpose. And so people are at different places. So it's not just a universal, if you're sinning, you're not a Christian. But it's people who are given over to this sin and they, they don't really want to come out of it. They want to stay in it. Their heart's not with the Lord. They're, well, they're probably not saved. Because for a Christian, certainly not. How? This is what he says. How shall we who died to sin live any longer? It's like an oxymoron. How can you continue in something when you're dead to it? You, you can't. That's what he's saying here. So that's the context of this section. Or do you not know that as many as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Now, what I'm getting to is you have the same spirit and power that Paul had in the preaching of the gospel to the Corinthians because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is I preach Christ and him crucified. You can preach Christ and him crucified. It's the power of God unto salvation. So, he, so Christians have the same power. Now, obviously, Paul was called to preach more and a demonstration of that as an apostle. And there's some who have more capacity and gifting in the fruitfulness of that. But all of us have, as Christians access this power when we share the gospel. So do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ and you here have been baptized into Christ, you were baptized, therefore, into his death? So verse 4, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, I want you to note, I've underlined it here, that, Christ, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, who was he raised from the dead by? Now, Jesus said, I lay down my life and I take it up again. Obviously, he had power over his own life. But what he's making clear here, Paul is making clear here, is by the glory of the Father. It is the spirit of the Father that raised Jesus from the dead because he died as a man and he had to be a man and he died as a sinless sacrifice. So therefore, his life, into the hands of the Father when he died. So Jesus gave something up where he could take on death and then he, then he had to trust the spirit of the Father to raise him from the dead. So what he's saying is if you have been baptised into the death of Christ, then you have this same hope and promise that just as the spirit of the Father raised Jesus from the dead, so too will the spirit of the Father raise you from the dead. So I always get frustrated when I hear gospels about prosperity and all that sort of thing. And I'm thinking you have brought the gospel from the glory of the resurrection from the dead down to the dust. But anyhow, don't get me started. 
Note here that it is the glory of the Father that raised him from the dead. Therefore, it is the spirit of the Father that raises us from the dead. Now, I'm going to launch into something that I touched on a while back and dropped it in for you to start thinking about. God is spirit. So the Father is spirit, Jesus is spirit, and the Holy Spirit is spirit. So every time you see the word spirit, you just can't automatically assume it's talking about the Holy Spirit. You've got to think which spirit. This in context is clearly saying it is the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. So therefore, in the rest of this context, it's going to be the spirit of the Father that raised Jesus from the dead. And it's the spirit of the Father that will raise you from the dead. Verse 5, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's where we get the idea that, yes, this is why salvation is about death of self, buried into Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ in me. And you rise out of the waters of baptism as the symbol of the resurrection life you now enter, but also the resurrection of the body and the eternal life and the glory. This is what salvation is about. Jesus, Jesus could have had the whole world if he had bowed down and worshipped Satan. Satan said, here, I'll give you the whole world. Just bow down and worship me. So Jesus didn't come for the world like that. He came to die on the cross to pay the price for the sins for eternal life. So if we're Christians and we're following the Lord, it's not about the natural things of this life. It's about eternal life into the kingdom and into eternal life of resurrection from the dead. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. And this is why we've got to keep putting to death, you know, get up daily, crucify the flesh daily, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That's why if you want to have confidence of the resurrection from the dead, you need to see evidence of the manifestation of Christ in you, changing the nature and character of your life from one of lust and desire for sin to desire for righteousness. Not a, not a sinless perfection, but definitely a progression. Like when the woman was caught in adultery and he said to her, go and sin no more, she was capable of never committing adultery again. Now, she might have slipped up somewhere, but she might have also gone away and never committed adultery. But there would be other sins that she would commit. He didn't say go away and commit sinless perfection and then I'll accept you into the kingdom. But there's got to be a heart that turns away from sin and then calls on the Lord for salvation, buried into his death to have promise of the resurrection from the dead. So when we get back to what Paul is saying, I came to you with the spirit and power, not with the wisdom of men. What spirit and what power is he talking about? Not the spirit and power to perform miracles, but the spirit and power in the gospel, which is the spirit of the Father to raise people from the dead. So when you preach your words, as you explain this to people, your words have the spirit and power, which is the resurrection from the dead by the power of Christ. As Christ was risen from the dead, so you too can be raised from the dead by the same spirit. If you, you are born again, baptised into the death of Christ, which is the big part, I think, which is missing in a lot of Christendom today. Just put up your hand and ask Jesus into your heart. It's not this process, is it? The process is death to self and life in Christ. Continuing back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. However, we speak wisdom. So even though he says we don't speak wisdom, it's based in the spirit and power of the gospel. He then goes on and says, but we do speak wisdom, but it's not the wisdom of the world. It is the wisdom that is spiritual wisdom. And he says that we speak this wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. It's going nowhere. Wisdom and knowledge that helps one move towards maturity is used by Paul. So therefore, there is a progression, a progression of understanding of the word, a progression of knowledge, a progression of this power. He uses knowledge and wisdom to help the mature and those who are coming to maturity. But this wisdom is not the wisdom of the world, and we covered this a lot more last week. Now, the church, this is why I say the church makes a mistake when it picks up cultural trends and combines them with Christianity. Remember, the philosophies of this world, the wisdom of this world is coming to what? Nothing. So when we pick up the philosophy of the world, we pick up something that is nothing. It's leading to nothing. So why does the church tend to pick up cultural things and become part of the 
church, and I'm talking more about Christendom. So the church makes a mistake when it picks up the cultural trends and combines them with Christianity. Picking up the causes of the world is a mistake. These worldly causes, based in worldly wisdom, come to nothing. There is nothing in them that helps one come to eternal life. There's nothing in them that helps one progress to spiritual maturity. So things like social welfare, social justice, feminism, racism, LBTQ, transgenderism, gender fluidism, uh, humanism, secular human, humanism. Our culture is full of philosophies. And any of those philosophies that we pick up and somehow ends up like a hybrid with our Christianity, we've contaminated Christianity with something which is a philosophy of this world which will produce nothing. And there's many Christians who are patting themselves on the back because they're on some sort of crusade in our culture that are producing nothing. So when they stand before the Lord and they give an account, he'll say, well, that's nothing. That, that, that'll be burned up like wood, straw, hay, stubble. Why? Because Jesus didn't come to transform the world. He came to save sinners. What's going to happen to this world in the end? This world is going to be no more and there'll be a new heaven and earth. He didn't come to, to sort of transform the political systems of this world. The reason we'll have a transformed political system for a thousand years under his rule is to show man his wickedness. Because after a thousand years of rule under the perfect man, Christ, Satan is released and then all the nations of the world gather against that Christ and try to kill him. There's another battle at the end of the thousand years. As soon as Satan is released, so after a thousand years of righteous rule, humanity will try and get rid of the righteous king and put Satan back in his place. The thousand years is to fulfill all that sort of prophecy. It's the same thing for men to see how wicked it is that in the end he's still going to do it. That when God says there's no more heaven, there's no more earth, there was no place found for them anymore, and there'll be a new heaven and earth, everybody will know that that is completely justified. No one will be able to say to him, but we didn't experience life in this world with a good, good ruler. If we had better government, well, the world is going to have the most perfect government system they possibly can in all of existence under Christ for a thousand years. And then they're still going to want to displace him from his throne and put Satan back in his place. The wickedness of men. All right, so, so there's nothing in the world that is of any eternal value. And there's nothing within the natural man that has any eternal value. All glory, all honour, all praise unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore we have the power and the spirit that Paul is talking about, which is the power of the gospel, the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you can declare to anyone the same spirit and power. Continuing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would, have, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I want to talk about this mystery because I see a lot of stuff online that really overemphasizes this mystery business to the point that they say that there's a completely different gospel for Christians under Paul, like as if Paul preached a different gospel than Peter because one was to the Jews and the Gentiles and there's this mystery of a gospel to the Gentiles. People just get this way out. So I'm just going to explain to you this mystery. It's quite, it's quite easy. It's quite straightforward. Why is he even bringing this up here? Remember, he's talking about not the wisdom of men, but the wisdom of God or the wisdom which is from God. And we're going to end up at that place where it says you have the mind of Christ. So therefore, how can there be a hidden wisdom if we have the mind of Christ? And that's what he's going to say. We're going to see it shortly, that he'll take us from where the, the mystery of the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, the gospel, was a mystery to the Old Testament and the old prophets. We're going to show you it. But then once Jesus came, the mystery was revealed, and that mystery is resurrection life in Jesus Christ because they were expecting a very different thing. Now, we know from this statement that the hidden mystery is the mystery of Christ as the Messiah. So if you have a look at it, 1 Corinthians 2, 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. So he is saying, we're speaking the mystery. We are using words to explain the mystery, which is the wisdom of God. So he's basically said, we speak the mystery. 
So therefore, it's no longer a mystery. Paul's speaking it. Which God ordained before the ages for our glory. So therefore, when he goes on and says, of which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, what's he having a direct poke at here? Corinthian church, the synagogue. Remember the guys who beat up, replaced their saved priest and got another priest in? He's having a direct dig at the Jewish system and he's saying, none of the rulers of this age knew this. They don't, the, the synagogue and the priests in the synagogue, they do not know this mystery. This mystery is hidden from them. This mystery was hidden from the Old Testament prophets. They prophesied about it, but they only understood in part. So Paul is saying, we speak this wisdom, which means Paul says, we know what the, this mystery is. And it's the wisdom of Christ. And I'm about to explain it to you. We know from this statement that the hidden mystery is the mystery of Christ as the Messiah. Remember, they rejected him as the Messiah. So every person that you witness to that rejects Jesus Christ as the Messiah is hidden to the mystery. There are, hence, the Father has to draw people to Christ and remove the spiritual blindness so that they see the hidden mystery, which is the wisdom of God, which is Christ crucified. So the mystery of Christ, who he was, what he was doing, was hidden from them. This mystery is still hidden from many today. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, it says, The mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. So elsewhere in Colossians, he talks about this mystery in several places, but this is Colossians 1, 26. So the mystery has been revealed to his saints. Remember how I got you to point out who are saints? Those who put their saving faith into Jesus Christ, there and now and forever, all of them are saints. That means if you put your faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ here, you are a saint, which means then that the hidden mystery of the ages for generations has been revealed to you as his saint. How can I say that? Because you have put saving faith in Jesus Christ, that he was dead, buried and rose again. So therefore you'll put your faith in the mystery which was hidden, which was Christ crucified, which is why you can preach with the spirit and power of Paul, because the power is Christ crucified, the hidden wisdom, the hidden mystery that you now know because you are saved. I think what this does for me is it makes me realise don't take for granted what you see as self-evident. It's hidden from people. By God's grace, he has taken away the blindness so we can see this in Jesus Christ. No, the Corinthians were called saints. I went through that, sorry. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 also says, To them, that saints, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. So God determined to make known to the saints, because that's the context, the richness of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And it says, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, it tells us what the mystery is. Among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. The mystery is how can God dwell in you? That was absolutely foreign to, and that is foreign to every religion in the world. That is foreign to Judaism. That is foreign to all these religions. The mystery is that Christ himself can live in you, which is, that's why we preach the power of the gospel, Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, that as you are baptized into his death, therefore the same power, which is the spirit of the Father, which raised him from the dead, is the same power, the spirit of the Father, that will raise you from the dead. And how does this all happen? This is the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, if this is the mystery, this is the center of your faith. So if you don't get confused by a lot of stuff that goes on in church and Christianity, this is the center of your faith. Intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ in this truth of the word and the power of the spirit, Christ in you. Jesus Christ, if you were a born again believer, is in you. So then you stop and meditate on that. God is in me. God is with me. That's the mystery that no other religion can offer. No other, no other form has anything like this. And how do we know this is true? 
because we see the transformation of people's lives. So the power is, here's a, here's a wretched life that the spirit of the Father and the Son come into in salvation, and then you see them. I, I don't know, you've probably seen this too, where someone walks in that this has happened, you know, probably a drug addict, long hair, scruff, dirty, you know, all messed up, get saved, and then you come back and see that guy two years later and you don't even recognise him because he's been transformed. The spirit of the Father and the Son have come into him and now the power to the resurrection life is in him and he changes. That change is not self-improvement to a better version of himself. That is transformed salvation life, which gives evidence to Christ in you. And many of you have seen that. That's the power Paul is talking about, not the power to perform a miracle. Because if it's the power to perform a miracle, then only miracle workers can do anything. And that's the problem. It makes an elite out of miracle workers. Paul tells us that the hidden mystery is the mystery that is only hidden to those who are perishing, but revealed to those being saved, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, still in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, him we preach. So this is what we preach, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. So we don't preach social welfare. We don't preach social justice. We don't preach uh, sexual equity or whatever in the LGBTQ. And we don't preach you can have any gender you like. We don't preach the worldly message. We preach him, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Warning every man, let go of the philosophies of this world because they are coming to nothing and teaching every man in all wisdom, which is the spiritual wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, that perfection is positional sanctification, justification. You have a position, don't worry, if you're still struggling with sin, you're still going to be presented perfect because it's in Christ. But then as you progress to maturity, you see the nature of Christ manifest in your life as you die and you progress towards spiritual maturity, some one, some five, some ten. Some 10 cities, some five cities, some not at all. All right, progression, you still need to progress. It, I, I just want you to absolutely get out of your mind the idea that every Christian is going to get the same thing in heaven. That's that idea, I believe in Jesus, I'm going to die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's what happens to all believers, so all believers get the same thing. That's not biblical. So therefore, yes, you will be presented before the Lord completely without any concern because you'll be perfect in Christ Jesus. But there's a need to progress in sanctification for what's there. We're not going to be just sitting on clouds. Everybody gets their assigned cloud and harp. Because if that's the case, then all you have to do is believe in Jesus. Let's go fishing. You know, like it just doesn't work that way, does it? You intuitively know that this, this is not a faith that says, I believe in Jesus, I'm going to get everything, just do what I want until I die or he comes. That, that's a trick of the enemy. So here we have been made perfect, which is positional sanctification. We are also pressing on to perfection, established in progressive sanctification. And to make sure you understand this, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. Philippians 3, 12 to 14, it literally says, not that I have already attained or am already perfect, all right? So this seems a contradiction, doesn't it? Because it says in Colossians that we, may be, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. But then he says, not that I have already attained or am already perfect, which means that Paul, if he died at that point in time, there's something about him where he says, I'm not perfected. And yet they preach to every man that they'll be presented perfect in Christ Jesus. Notice the difference between Colossians and Philippians. One says, in Christ. The other says, press on. So Philippians 3.12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So in Colossians chapter one, is it one twenty-eight? Yeah, Colossians one twenty-eight. Every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So we're laying hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of us, which is Colossians. 
Christ has laid hold of us, which gives us positional perfection in Christ because he is perfect. So that's positional sanctification. But in Philippians, he said, not that I've attained it or am already perfected, but I press on that who? I may lay hold of what Christ has taken hold of me for. Which means, yes, positionally, if I die, I'm perfected in Christ. But as I'm living, I'm trying to lay hold of that perfection in Christ, which is the dying to self daily, surrendering your life, letting the Spirit of God manifest himself in you and laying hold of what Christ has laid hold of you for. This is giving you a deeper understanding of positional sanctification and progressive sanctification because in most Christians, they seem like a contradiction. How can I be perfectly sanctified and yet need to progress in sanctification? It's like a natural oxymoron. But it's true because we're laying hold of Christ Jesus for what he has laid hold of us for. And that progression is going to lead to different rewards. Remember, every man's work will be tested and you'll be rewarded according to the work. That is not your work to take old ladies across the road, that is Christ's work in you. And so therefore, as you lay hold of Christ in you, you progress. That's why you can be rewarded for your work and still get everything in heaven and the kingdom bring glory to God because that work is not self-initiated, carnal, natural work. It's the work of Christ in you as you die to yourself and you progress. So therefore, I am laying hold of Christ for all that he has taken hold of me for positionally sanctified, progressing in sanctification. Paul clearly says, not that I have already been perfected. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those which are ahead. Don't let the past be a stumbling block to the future. Like if you feel like a spiritual failure because of sin and inability to die to yourself and surrender your life to the Lord, that's in your past. What he's saying is forget those things. Forget all that. Press on and lay hold of what Jesus Christ has laid hold of you for, which is perfect sanctification in his eyes. And you can begin to apprehend that perfection. Because this is what it is. You know, we, we say to the Lord, Lord, I love you, but those words aren't enough. And why do I love him? Like, you've got to ask, why do you love the Lord? Well, I love the Lord because when I look at Jesus, I see perfection. I, I see righteousness and holiness. and perf- I see something that I can't see anywhere else but in Christ. I can't see it like I see his image in you, but not to the degree of him because he's in you. The same as me. You can see something of Christ in me. But when I look at Jesus, it's perf- perfect holiness. He knows every thought I have. He knows every intent of my heart. He understands everything. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. He was without sin, willingly gave up his own life. He is perfect. So therefore, we don't just love him and thank him. We worship him. So he gets that place that no one else gets but him. We worship him. And this is the mystery. Christ, him, in you. That's, that's just, that'll do. Let's just go meditate on that for the rest of our life. <laughs> it's just incredible, isn't it? Christ, the perfect, holy, righteous, or powerful creator God, perfectly just and obedient to the Father, died, buried, rose again. You know, his perfection in you. That's the mystery that was hidden. That's the mystery that is now revealed, Christ in you. And we can begin to apprehend that in our walk because in Philippians 3.14, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, for every true believer who understands this gospel properly, you know that the upward call, in other words, your death or the, or the rapture, you know that that is your goal. That is your prize because it says, I press toward what the goal The prize. It literally says, I press toward the goal for the prize. So all the suffering we experience in this fallen, God-hating, Christ-rejecting world with all its ridiculous philosophies and the suffering that we go through trying to live for Christ, but the joy that is in here, the kingdom of God within you. So therefore, the, the Bible literally says, those who hate their life in this world will find it. So so we're not supposed to be loving life in this world. Like a lot of preachers say, embrace life. And the Bible says, hate that life. Why? Because it's corrupted, it's wicked, it's evil, it's full of every godless 
philosophy that man can make up out of the wickedness of his own heart, and you want to love that? No. This is what we love, the upward call to the perfection of God. The one who is in us, the perfect one, the holy one that we worship, we're going to be lifted up into him and shall forever be with the Lord. That's our prize. So please, at my funeral, dance, sing, shout for joy and go, Philip finally got his prize. (laughs) He finally got death is our reward because it's the release from this fallen world into the glory of the kingdom. And when you truly know the Lord and if you struggle to have faith facing death, then get to know the Lord. Say, Lord, come. Like Philip preached today about you being in me. That means God is right here. You're right here. Lord, I want to know you. I want to be intimate with you. I want want to just have that confidence that when that time comes, I'll be rejoicing that I'm coming home to glory, that there'll be no fear, there'll be no doubt. I'll I'll be receiving my prize and we'll be all ready to go. I would have sacrificed my life in service to you. I would have progressed. I would have become all that you wanted to be. I would have filled out my life in you, Jesus Christ, ready to come home. That's what at the heart of every believer should be. Back to Corinthians. We see here that Paul cannot be saying in the Corinthians to not use wisdom, but make sure that the wisdom that they use is the wisdom from God and not from self or the world. So continuing at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, let's see if we can get the chapter done. I might have time. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, people often use this verse to talk about God having personal plans for your life, like marriage, work, home, etc., The context put this in a very different place. This is not a verse for your personal life. So this is not a verse to say, my eye hasn't seen or my ear heard or has entered into my heart the things which God has prepared for me because I love him. And you take it down from where it is in scripture and make it about he has a personal plan for your life. That is not this context. The context put this in a very different place from personal plans for blessing. It is talking about a very specific blessing. Paul shows that the mystery was hidden right in front of their eyes. Remember the people he's talking to. He said, there's people who have this mystery hidden. So they know well that the prophet Isaiah, and this is the quote from Isaiah. So he's quoting Isaiah to them and he's trying to show them they know well But the mystery is hidden right in front of them. So it's not talking about that God has things planned for you personally. It's talking about God had things planned, the hidden mystery, which the prophets didn't fully know, and the priests in the synagogue don't understand, but Paul has revealed to you because he's spoken the wisdom. It's talking about that. That's the context. So that is the thing which didn't enter into the heart of man, nor entered into the heart of men, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. What has he prepared for those who love him? I've just been through it. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the hidden mystery. Paul has literally said this elsewhere. So this is not a verse to claim personal blessing. Now, we're going to go and have a look at Isaiah. And yeah, I'm not going to get through all this. We're going to have a look at Isaiah chapter 64. And I encourage you to turn there. And I'll probably just have to finish here because there's so much in this. What Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, I has not seen nor ear heard nor had entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. He's talking about the people who are unable to receive the mystery of the wisdom, which is Christ crucified, the power of God, the salvation that Christ is in you. That's the mystery. That's the wisdom that is hidden from some people. And now that he's quoting Isaiah 64, we're going to read from verse 1 to 8. And when we're reading it, as we read it, We now understand the mystery revealed. So it'll stand out to you. We'll see this very differently than how they saw it. And Paul knew this. So when he quoted this section of scripture, he's saying what's in here was hidden to them, but I've explained it to you. So now when you read Isaiah 64, you're going to see the hidden mystery which was hidden from the prophets of old and hidden from the false teachers. Let's read it. Isaiah 64, 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. So this is a prayer from Isaiah for Israel, I'm pretty sure. 
Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. As fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down, the mountains shook at your presence. This is when the presence of God came down at Mount Sinai with Moses. When you did awesome things, the fire came down on the mountain. And so what Isaiah is praying is that you would, that you would do this again, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake again at your presence. As fire burns the brushwood and fire causes the water to boil to make your name known to the adversaries that the nations may tremble at your presence. In other words, he's praying, come down, Lord, like you did with Moses when you came down on the mountain and the mountain was in lightning and thunder and they were so afraid. They said, Moses, you go up there. We want nothing to do with this. They were so afraid. And, and so as I said, come down, Lord, when he did awesome things. But verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by ear. So this is the quote that Paul's picked up. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God beside you who acts for the one who waits for him. You, you meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. This is what he's quoting. That's the section, verse 4 and probably into 5, and he's paraphrased it a little bit. Now, this is what, so the context is in Isaiah, because remember, the people he's preaching to understood this. And what he's explaining is the mystery was hidden to these people, and we can see it here. So these people are not seeing salvation. What they're seeing is God coming like he did for Moses in power upon the mountain with fire. Now, we know when that's going to happen, don't we? Jesus comes in judgment. But read on, verse 5, halfway through. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. There's the hidden mystery. Isaiah, what is it, 60, 64, 5, at the end of the verse. We need to be saved. They couldn't see it because they thought saving was the power of God coming down upon the mountain to slay their physical enemies. So hence, when the Jews saw Jesus as the Messiah, this is what they were looking for, the power of God to come down and slay their enemies and vindicate Israel. And so they couldn't see the Saviour, the one who would save them from their sins. So when you read 5, you, we need to be saved. Ah, I know how you get saved. So you see, because I know the mystery now, I can see the mystery in this that they couldn't see. And that's the point that Paul is pointing out. Verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name or stir who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Verse 8, but now, O Lord, you are our Father. Now, you know the verse. Abba, Father. So when you read that, you see a very different thing than the Jews did. So this is what Paul is saying. He's quoting Isaiah. They all knew it. They're quoting Isaiah. They're going back to it and said, yeah, we thought that was about God, our Father, coming down on the mountain with fire to establish Israel. And he said, no, the mystery that was in there that you didn't see was Jesus Christ and him crucified, the power of God to salvation, to deal with the very thing that Isaiah prayed about. We need to be saved. And so it's the mystery of salvation is hidden and was hidden from the prophets, was hidden from the Jews, and is hidden from many people today, but has been revealed to you because you are saved. Because in verse 8, but now, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, you are the potter. We sing those songs, don't we? And all we are the work of your hand. Now, they, they saw this completely different. You see that as now Christ is in me, which is the mystery, Christ in you, but you now know that as Christ in you, you become the clay, he's the body, he's transforming your life. This means something completely different to you than what it meant to them. And so Paul is trying to say what they thought it was, was the truth of it, the wisdom of it was hidden from them. But now it's not hidden because we speak this wisdom and we speak this wisdom, which is Christ crucified, the power of God to salvation, that Christ is in you 
And therefore, you are the clay and he is the potter. So therefore, when we go back to that verse that people use to claim that they can get personal blessing, eye has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. It's not about you getting a better house, a bigger car, a better job, health, wealth, blessing or anything else. This in direct context is in Isaiah, which means he's trying to show them the mystery which was hidden was hidden by the eyes and hearts of people, which has now been revealed to you, Christ in you. Run out of time. So we're going to have to pick that up from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Now, because we didn't quite get there, let me just close with a thought for you, which is we know that at the end of this chapter, he says, you have the mind of Christ. What that means is that Division in the church, because remember the context is schism. Division in the church is people who are not exercising the mind of Christ. Schisms is evidence of not having the mind of Christ. So that means there's, and, and so the f- first port of call, don't go, don't go looking at everybody else. <laughs> the first port of call is to think, where, Lord, have I been involved in schisms? Where, where have I been divisive? Where... I have not exercised your mind, but I've exercised my own mind. What sort of seemed right to me at the time seemed the right thing to say, the right thing to do, but now with your mind, I look back and go, no, that wasn't right. And so I was involved in division, and whether that's division even in marriage, or division in family, or division in churches, you know, where, where you've come and caused division, but that's not the mind of Christ that causes division. That's your mind that causes division. And that's where it's going to end up with, but I'll obviously pick it up and finish it off a bit more next week because we've run out of time. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we can just go away and meditate today, I pray, on the mystery revealed that you are in us. Lord, I pray that everyone here will know the intimacy of fellowship with you. You are our saviour, the perfect one, the holy one absolutely perfect and without sin, giving up your life a ransom for many. You have saved us. You have redeemed us. You have justified us. You have purchased us. Lord, you are everything to us. Because even if we suffer in the natural, we know that as we have been buried with you, we have the hope of the resurrection of the glory by the Spirit of the Father. Lord, I pray that by your grace that people will be able to hear and those listening online will be able to understand more deeply what the hidden mystery is, a great mystery and gift that you've given us. That, Lord, when that day comes, and for some of us it's closer than others or your return, that it truly be a day of rejoicing for us that we are about to get the prize, the goal of our life, the upward call into Christ Jesus. Help it to be true in every heart here, I pray, Lord, in your wonderful name. Amen.